time to duel. Um, I thought this was supposed to be able to fit sleeved cards. Hold on, uh, this is going to take a minute. Hey, this is Ektar, and as many of you guys would already know, I was a huge Yu-Gi-Oh fan growing up. In fact, before I got into anime in high school, Yu-Gi-Oh was my life. I was introduced to it in primary school, getting when young, right? As all the boys in my class were obsessed with the game. That was way back before the English release of the card game. How on earth did we play? Back then, none of us could read Japanese, so we gathered what we could from official Chinese translations of the manga and the kanji, which were essentially Chinese characters, in the rulebook and the card text. Of course, almost none of the effects were accurate, and we all made stuff up as we went along. But I was hooked. I bought so many Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you wouldn't even believe. After getting a hold of my very first set of cards, the EXR starter set, which I still have most of here, I took every opportunity to beg my parents to buy me cards. The reason I mention this is that I was right there in the heat of things when the English version was released. Yes, I was fortunate enough to get my hands on a ton of first edition cards. We are talking whole booster boxes for birthdays and Christmases and whenever I did well for important exams. Hey, I was a really good negotiator as a kid. Despite my young age, thanks to the fact that I was a really seasoned player and collector, I knew how to take care of my cards. Cards that were played with were double sleeved and cards that weren't were kept safe and sound in my Yu-Gi-Oh card farm. And that is where most of my English cards lay for more than a decade. For you see, after I got older and got into the original Yu-Gi-Oh anime, I stopped playing actively and started focusing on collecting Japanese cards only, as replicas to complement my love of the show. It was not until I watched a video of the top rarest Yu-Gi-Oh cards that I realized that I had some pretty rare and sold off the cards in my collection. I didn't believe it at first, but after a quick search online, I was convinced. And it was then that I decided to send them in to PSA to be graded. Now, for those of you who don't know, grading services like PSA or BGS take your card, place them in a plastic slab, and assign them a number grade based on their condition. For PSA, it's between 1 to 10, 1 being poor and 10 being gem mint. The higher the grade, the more value the cards will fetch, as there is an objective standard. Typically, these grades are exponential, and you want an 8 and above. The thing is, the grading is actually rather subjective at times, and as you'll see, some cards can be assigned a lower grade for really arbitrary reasons, and sometimes, rarely, vice versa. So first, I had to decide which cards I was going to send in. Grading can be a rather expensive affair, as they charge you per card, and you have to pay for shipping to get the cards to them. Therefore, it would make the most sense to send in the cards that would fetch the most money. However, some of these cards I sent in just for the heck of it, even though I knew they weren't worth much because I thought they were cool nonetheless. I also decided that I would not be grading any of my Japanese cards as in general, Japanese cards aren't as valuable as English cards, unless you have some like super rare card from the 90s. Not to mention, unlike the English cards, Japanese cards don't have first editions. Even if they were as valuable, the Japanese card market doesn't really care about grading and the English card market doesn't really care about Japanese cards. Lastly, graded cards can't fit in the binder any longer and my Japanese card binder has more value to me sentimentally as a whole than any one card. The grading process was rather involved and not as intuitive as I thought. I had to create the order, list the cards, buy these things called card sabers to put the cards in, label each card, pack them up, ship them by DHL, and wait a couple of months for the results. Needless to say, I was rather anxious, but all in all, aside from one or two head scratches and disappointments, I can't say that I was disappointed with the results. Speaking of the results, here they are. Note that I won't be mentioning price in this video as they fluctuate and I don't want to come off as bragging even though I totally am, so feel free to research the prices after you see this video. We first start off with two cards from the very first collector's tins from 2002. We have BPT-001 Dark Magician and we have BPT-003 Blue Eyes White Dragon. Next up, from the very first starter decks, we have the first edition SDY-006 Dark Magician and the SDK-001 Blue Eyes White Dragon. Slightly annoyed that the Blue Eyes got a 6, but 
it's kind of understandable because this one does have a little bit of a dented corner. Unfortunate, but what you gonna do? While not from a starter deck, we have one of the most expensive cards in this set, North American English, first edition, LOB 070 Red Eyes Black Dragon. The ones that crop up most often online are the Asian English versions identified by a different logo on the bottom right on the back of the card, and those are nowhere near as rare or valuable as this one. I don't know why these are so rare or sought after, but hey, I'm not complaining. And now, what can be said to be the centerpiece of my entire collection? You know him, the one, the only, 2002 Dark Dual Stories DDS-001 Blue Eyes White Dragon. Yeah, we also have the Dark Magician and the Exodia 2, but who really cares about them, am I right? Anyways, back to the Blue Eyes. This is the card that most collectors want in their collection. For those who don't know, as the name implies, this card along with the Dark Magician and Exodia came bundled together with the Game Boy Color game Dark Dual Stories, but only in the first printing. Later editions came with a different set of cards. This Blue Eyes White Dragon is the only version of this card with this fan-favorite enemy-used art that comes in prismatic secret rare, making it really appealing to the eye. However, because this card is so in demand, supply is also way, way up, making it a little bit less valuable than it was. It still commands a pretty penny, and I'm beyond elated to be in the possession of one. The annoying thing is, this set didn't get all 9s, but that's only because this card wasn't centered properly, which is something that affects the grading. Moving on, we have yet another set of game promos. This time, the first ever English renditions of the Egyptian God cards, we have GBI-001, Sly for the Sky Dragon, GBI 002, Obelisk the Tormentor, and GBI 003, The Winged Dragon of Ra, that came with the Japanese game Dwarf Monsters International Worldwide Edition. Like the DDS before it, the first editions of the game came with secret rare cards and you can tell from the silver text, the sparkly silver text, while standard editions came with the ultra rare cards or the gold text. As you can see from the label here, uh, these are the rarer secret rare versions. Annoyingly enough, just like with my DDS set, they gave Obelisk, my favorite Egyptian god, a much, much lower grade than Slifer and Ra, breaking up the set once again. And I can only assume it's due to poor centering on the card back once again. Alrighty, from here on out, we have a number of random cards that don't really belong in any set. First up, we have a first edition LOB108 Man Eater Bug. Next is a 2003 promo DMG001 Dark Paladin that came with the Dwarf Master's Guide. Really wish I had the first edition Magician's Force Dark Paladin with the error art. Next here is a YMA EN001 Slifer from the Annie Manga released in 2004. Also released in 2004 is a PCK001 Blue Eyes promo card that came with the Kaima version of the Power of Chaos PC game. Next is a 2005 MC2 EN004 Black Luster Soldier from the Master Collection Volume 2. And last but not least, a Shonen Jump Magazine promo JMP EN005 Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Now, the thing about this guy is that there are two versions of this promo as well. A secret rare with a sparkly silver text and an ultra rare, uh, the one with gold text. Unfortunately, unlike with the GBI promo god cards, PSA doesn't seem to differentiate between them, which kind of muddies the value quite a bit, but Hey, you got a gem in 10, and it's still, still a cool card nonetheless. And with that, we've come to the end. Looking through my storeroom and old card collections, I recently managed to unearth a couple more cards I plan to send in. We have LOB first editions of the rather iconic Pot of Greed, Trap Hole, and Monster Reborn. Still not sure what this card does. 
I do have a ton more first edition cards left, but they're pretty much all common or normal rare cards. Sadly, the rest of my ultra rare and above cards in my uh, English card binder aren't worth much either, being from later sets after everyone started collecting and playing. I hope you guys enjoyed this look through my rather humble PSA card collection. Have you guys ever considered getting your cards graded? Or perhaps you own some graded cards? If you do, do let me know in the comments below. So, this act are saying, Duel, stand by! And see you guys in the next episode.